Good afternoon. I am Monica Hendrickson, the Public Health Administrator for Peoria uh, City County Health Department, and welcome to our Tri-County update. For December 16th, the Tri-County now sits at 62,150 cases. That is an increase, sadly, of over 2,000 cases in the past week alone. To be exact, it was an additional 2,030 cases we added in our Tri-County. That includes 914 new cases in Peoria, bringing our two-date total to 30,959. An additional 894 cases in Tazewell County, bringing it to 24,237. An additional 222 cases in Woodford, bringing it to 6,954. We're also saddened to report an additional 15 deaths in the past week alone in the Tri-County. 10 were Peoria County residents, bringing our two-date total to 435. Five were Tazewell County residents, bringing their total to 352. And there were no new deaths to report this past week for Woodford, maintaining 108 deaths. We added just over 300 additional cases at home and isolating, so that are now we have 2,515 active cases currently. Previously, we had 220, sorry, 2,216. We maintained steady in terms of our hospitalization. Last week, we had 69 Tri-County residents hospitalized. We are currently at 64. Our average for both the Tri-County and Peoria County tends to increase. We're now averaging just under 300 new cases each day in the Tri-County at 290. And for Peoria specifically, we're averaging 131 new cases each day. Our hospital systems are at capacity with 39 ICU beds in use for COVID alone and 113 non-ICU beds in use for COVID. We're also saddened to report five deaths in the past 24 hours in our hospital systems. They are now averaging 36 ICU beds in use for COVID patients and 115 non-ICU beds for COVID patients. Currently in Peoria region, which includes Peoria, Tazewell, and Woodford, our ICU bed capacity is nowhere close to where we want to be. We're sitting at only 11% of our ICU beds in use, uh, and available, sorry, that are available, meaning that 89% of our ICU beds are currently in use. Our EDs are getting flooded with people coming for monoclonal antibody treatments as well as COVID testing on top of those that are coming in for significant complications related to COVID. Our region is coping with increased numbers of cases and both OSF and UniPoint Health are wanting to remind people that your care depends on your condition. First and foremost, individuals that are wanting monoclonal antibody treatment need to be talking to their uh, primary care provider. This treatment is not available in our emergency departments, but is routine and is accessible to our community. In addition, patients who need a COVID-19 test for school or for work purposes need to go to a designated testing site. Again, our emergency departments are not primary locations for COVID testing, but rather go to one of our prompt cares, ambulatory cares, or retail pharmacies, as well as the Civic Center. And lastly, patients that should be going to the ER are those that are experiencing significant symptoms related to their COVID-19 diagnosis. So again, keep our EDs safe, keep them effective, so make sure you're reusing them appropriately, not for treatment purposes and not for testing purposes. Those can be done throughout the community. We have two speakers today. Our first speaker is uh, Dave Mingus, a licensed behavioral health professional at Unity Place, Unity Point, to speak as we kind of go into this holiday season and part of the challenges that we might have during this time of year. Thank you, Monica. Good afternoon. The holiday season is here, as you all know. 
Though it's known as the most wonderful time of the year, the holidays for some can be stressful, overwhelming, and very lonely. A survey conducted in 2014 by the National Alliance on Health, Mental Health explored the impact of the holidays on people's mental health. Approximately 3,300 individuals completed the survey. I'd like to share a few of the results. 24% of people with a diagnosed mental health disorder were concerned and found that the holidays made their symptoms a lot worse. And 40% reported somewhat worse. 66% of the respondents reported feeling lonely during the holidays. Many people don't realize in the last year we've had a, a significant spike among adults. We estimate approximately 4 out of 10 adults are suffering from some type of anxiety or depression uh, symptoms. These numbers serve as an important reminder that this season is not joyful for all. There are many self-care tips that can help those with mental health concerns, such as depression and anxiety, cope during this holiday season. These tips can also help anyone experiencing added stress this time of year. This season is generally characterized as a season of kindness. So my first tip is to be kind to yourself. Make your health a priority. This includes both mental and physical health. Like most things, this is easier said than done with demands upon us currently. To do this requires us to set boundaries for how, we, how and where we spend our time and money. If there are activities that cause triggers it's of stress, it's okay to say no. Difficult, but, but sometimes we need to do that. And to set that boundary saying no thank you or unable to attend. That's a sign of good health as you're putting your needs above others' expectations. Boundaries are also important in our interaction with others. During these times, there are many divisive issues among family members. If you begin to feel that irritating feeling, take control of yourself in the situation and avoid an argument before it begins. Respectfully dis redirect the conversation or politely depart the situation. I can't stress this enough in our practice we see the divisiveness and people get really hooked into that argumentative behavior. And this goes nowhere. Please, please. Uh, I think the tornadoes in the South really are examples of how life can change fast. And it's important that we really take the time to, to have quality interaction with those we love. Especially with the, uh, as we continue to experience high transmission rates, to stay safe, please check continually with local guidelines before attending holiday events and gatherings. I can't stress enough after I heard those statistics and the different people. We can, common sense is first and foremost. Don't take chances. My second tip is to be mindful of your mood. If you find yourself feeling sad, anxious, or irritable, it's important to pay attention to these emotions and not to ignore them. Rather than reaching, reacting to these feelings, try to identify thoughts that contribute to these emotions. How we think impacts how we feel, and in turn, we respond. Being in touch with your feelings and thoughts and emotions can help you target the source of the stress and make changes when possible. I want to also caution as far as alcohol use to deal with emotion. We find that with depression, anxiety, and disease, and so often, people self-medicate their loneliness with alcohol. This is the first step to disaster. Third, keep a schedule. This will help you prioritize your time. Where possible, spend, spread out your extra holiday responsibilities over several days over the next few weeks to make sure you maintain a balance in the areas, including sleep, exercise, I want to stress exercise, and healthy nutrition. Keeping these areas of wellness in check can be difficult, especially when there seems to be fewer hours in the day and more treats and goodies at home. Keeping your routine as, as routine as possible is very much encouraged. My last encouragement is to cope with the holidays, is to reach out for help. It's always okay to turn to a trusted friend, family member, or professional if you are feeling overwhelmed or if you have noticed a change in your mental health. We have many resources in Central Illinois that are very good that provide mental health services, including Unity Place. If you're already seeing a counselor, consider, consider scheduling an extra session around the holidays. Last, it's, it's also important to have a list of crisis numbers on hand. There are local and national resources available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'll share two numbers with you now. Additional resource numbers have been mailed to the media to share as well. UniPoint Health, UniPlace, ERS is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week to respond to crisis. 
In Peoria County, the number is 309-671-8084. Oh, and say it one more time. Oh, I'm sorry. 309-671-8084. You. You're welcome. In Tazewell and Wicker County, is 309-347-1148. Good job. For emergencies, always call 911. Be kind to yourself this holiday season. Stay in tune with your emotion and reach out for support. Thank you very much. Yes. Very much so. We find that those statistics have increased significantly in the last year since the pandemic. Not just the pandemic, but also the economic situation is a contributing factor as well. Uh, a lot of uncertainty with, with uh, uh, our population, and we find ex uh, even more so with our youth than usual. I mean, we're experiencing tremendous increases in the anxiety and depression among young people. And young people are more inclined to act out on it uh, as far as potential suicide or self-harm than adults at times. Good question. Yes? It's still going on the same trend because when, the, when we first had the situation arise a year ago, everybody really band together and it was the support for all. People's rent was reduced or they didn't have to pay. Utilities were there. There was a whole uh, counter to, to help people out. And that was good, but now the, the, the checks have ceased. People want the rent money. And not always is spending time at home exactly pleasant because we found that a lot of people got along a lot better when they weren't at home. Uh, in isolation, so we're still in that trend going up at this point. Hopefully it'll come down, but I don't, I don't see it in the near future, particularly with statistics like we heard today. Anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica. I think our speaker touched on a really uh, excellent point, which is, you know, the differences in terms of capacity and what kind of um, issues are causing stress in one life. To kind of talk more about ways that we can alleviate some of that stress is Joe Dewin, Director of Community Development for the City of Peoria to talk about rental assistance. Uh, thank you, Monica. Uh, my name is Joe Dewin. I'm the Community Development Director for the City of Peoria. Um, just a, a little background on, on kind of some of the background work that's been going on and, and to thank a few people involved in a lot of processes throughout the entire pandemic. Uh, city staff has been meeting with multiple nonprofits uh, without our community, PCCO, the Health Department, uh, Home for All, Continuum of Care, United Way, Prairie State Legal Services, the Salvation Army, Phoenix Community Development Services, all with the, the general goal of, of what can we do to ensure that uh, the resources that are in our community and the resources in the state of Illinois are available to the, the public when they need them. Um, with that said, Monica asked uh, me to come today to talk about uh, the rental assistance program that is administered by the Illinois Housing Development Authority. Uh, that program uh, is an offshoot of the program they had earlier this year. Uh, they had funds left over. Uh, you may have heard through other um, articles and stories about money throughout the country not being spent on rental assistance. Uh, the state of Illinois actually has done a phenomenal job of administering their program and uh, has shelled out a lot of the money that is available. However, a significant amount of money is still available. So they reopened the program. Uh, so landlords or tenants can apply for the program until January 9th. It is for back rent. Uh, it, if you go to um, IllinoisHousingHelp.org, that's IllinoisHousingHelp.org. It's the website of Il Illinois Housing Development Authority, and you can apply directly online, and they walk you through the process. Uh, to be eligible, you have to have a financial hardship due to COVID. You have to be behind on rent, um, and then you'd be eligible for up to $25,000 in rental assistance through the state of Illinois. So I encourage, if you're if a tenant facing eviction, uh, talk to your landlord, put into a joint application, uh, and work with the state to get those funds. Uh, it's a win-win for everyone involved in the process. Uh, if you're a tenant in the city of Peoria and you're facing eviction, 
uh, please contact Prairie State Legal Services. Uh, they provide fantastic legal aid for residents that qualify. Uh, they've been a pivotal partner for the city of Peoria uh, the last 10 or 15 years on a, a significant amount of issues, but definitely during the pandemic, uh, tenants facing evictions, they've really stepped up to the plate to ensure that uh, while well, the tenant still might be facing eviction, they'll help them work through the legal process and make sure they're connected to any resources that are available. Outside of rental assistance, there are some other resources available within our community. Uh, the best bet to get updated information is to contact the United Way 211 line. Uh, they have a uh, list of all of the resources available for utility assistance, rental assistance. They'll connect you to the nonprofit that's administering uh, those programs. So the best person to reach out to, like I said, is 211 uh, and they'll walk you through the system. Um, the last thing I want to touch upon a little with, with the winter, uh, the colder weather, uh, the city of Peoria also has some resources to help homeowners who are, uh, may have a furnace breaking or, or another emergency situation at their house. Uh, you know, we've been lucky and haven't had the, the dangerous uh, temperatures yet, but uh, being in Illinois, I'm sure it's coming. Uh, and if un unfortunately, um, some of our, our citizens of Peoria don't have that emergency fund, and when their furnace breaks or something like that, uh, they need some additional funds. And because Peoria is an entitlement community through HUD, we have an emergency grant that is up to $5,000 for furnace replacement uh, for owner-occupied properties in the city of Peoria. So if you experience that situation and it could lead to homelessness, please contact our development center at 494-8600 and they will walk you through the process. Uh, happy to answer any questions about any of the information I provided. That last thing you were just talking about, um, the owner, um, what did you say? Owner-occupied. So do you have to make a certain amount of income? How do you qualify for that grant? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a, a HUD entitlement. It's for our money, so it's 80% of area median income. If you go to our website, appreciatepeoria.com, and click on Opportunities, all of that qualifying information is there. Uh, I don't remember the exact dates. It was around then. Um, I believe it was a little sooner than that, but that was when they started making the awards. Um, and then because of that, they, they knew they were going to reopen it in the winter if they had funds available. And do you have an idea of how many people in Peoria were granted that money? Uh, or it, or because it's a state program, Ida hasn't released that data yet. Thank you. And so uh, just to kind of reiterate some other, uh, going back a little bit to our data, we are definitely in a high surge. Our positivity rates keep climbing in our community. Um, and it really is wreaking havoc on our health care and public health systems. To give you perspective, the last time we saw numbers like this was in March, um, right around the St. Patrick's Day holiday. What's concerning is this is on the upward tick. We don't know if we're going to see a plateau and going back down or because of this time of year that we are putting ourselves in the past to see what we did this time last year, continuing increases of cases. Um, you know, I appreciate what um, Dave Mingus uh, communicated about taking that awareness. You know, I will be honest, um, this is the worst part about what our current situation is. To have our numbers be similar to March in a time period where vaccinations were not readily available and we did have testing just being more and more accessible. We're in a totally different situation. We marked this week our one year anniversary of vaccinations. I sat here or stood here and told you all that this was a light at the end of the tunnel. But today, all three counties sit just shy above 50% of a fully vaccinated community. There are no words to describe this. In a season of hope, a season of future and thinking of a new year and those prospects, I find myself and other public health and healthcare professionals in sadness. Um, these are our, the, it is really a hard way to communicate the situation we're in. Um, I understand if we were in a situation where we had limited vaccinations. I would understand if we were in a situation where testing just dropped off the face of the earth and we didn't even have treatment capacities, but we do. It really is a loss of words. 
I want to first take this opportunity to applaud the 55.16% of Peoria County residents that decided to take on action and get vaccinated for themselves, for their families, for their communities, and for strangers, recognizing that by getting vaccinated, they were slowing the spread of this virus. And now they are being tasked with asking for them to step up again and get boosters. As we see from the initial data of the Omicron variant, boosters are effective. They are going to prevent hospitalizations and severe illness, and we have to take that step. But again, I am continually standing here giving out data, and I know people may have stopped watching and stopped listening, but I cannot stress how severe we are in right now. Cases cannot keep going up at this rate. We have a solution. It's scientifically based. It is data-driven, and yet we only have 55.16% of our county fully vaccinated. So in a season of hope, I am very much saddened right now. I hope, though, because I am, someone reminded me today that I am optimistic. I think of myself as pragmatic, but they called me optimistic. I do hope that people take heed this holiday season and recognize that instead of giving someone the next iPad or giving someone, um, you know, that type of, you know, materialistic gift, the best thing you can give each other is to get out of this pandemic and to do so is to get vaccinated. That is the way. It is not a political issue. It is not an issue of understanding, is this something new and something novel or, you know, th we've never gone through this. We have. We know how to give out vaccines. We know how to get vaccines. We know they are effective. So it's a very simple solution. Just get vaccinated. And if you have done so, thank you. I appreciate it. We're just going to ask you to do one more and get a booster. With that, I'll open it up to any questions. So the current surge we're seeing is highly unvaccinated individuals. Yeah, and I, I, we can sugarcoat it a little bit and say, yes, we saw people come in. But what happens is when people came in, uh, masking and other social distancing, it, you know, that kind of went to the wayside. Uh, people are wearing masks. You know, we're seeing more and more states now mandating indoor masking back on the docket. But first and foremost, it is unvaccinated individuals. Now, we have some breakthrough cases that are coming through, and a lot of those people are ones that, again, stepped up into the right thing in the spring and, you know, late winter. But now they needed a booster, and sadly, they got exposed in the meantime. So, again, those boosters are really important. But I want to thank the people that you, I understand. It, it's difficult to be a breakthrough case. Um, and we know more than we did, you know, when these um, – these vaccines were first issued, but those boosters are really important. And so, again, we want to make sure everyone takes the opportunity to get those as well. Michael, when you talk about breakthrough cases, do you know if there's anyone in the hospital, you know, recently who was a breakthrough case? Who's kind of used it? Or is it breakthrough through the boosters as well? So we have not seen cases related to uh, boosters. And, again, that's the two weeks post-boosters. So right now we are lockstep with what we saw in the spike and surge in March. Um, again, we were starting to creep up from daily averages from, you know, going from 40s to 50s to 100s, and I think at that peak in March we were at 200. Now, the other peaks that we've had, we've averaged 500 cases. I mean, we were pretty much on the uptake. But to give perspective just right here, week after week we're adding, you know, we're growing by about 25% in terms of the number of cases in our community. So we went from averaging 60, to so the next week we were at 90, 120, and we're just ticking upwards in the Tri-County. Each week, we're almost growing by 25% in terms of, if not more at times. Yes, we're definitely seeing much more cases in unvaccinated populations. That's the demographic now. It's not a certain age range. It's not a certain age range. It's the fact that they are not vaccinated. So we've been talking about vaccine hesitancy for several months. Why do you think this, this continues to be the issue when we're still going to have 48% of the population that, that won't get a shot at all? 
You know, the, the excellent question about vaccine hesitancy and what, why people still are not choosing to do it. Um, I, I can't answer that. You know, I, I literally does keep me up at night to try to understand what the hesitancy and what approach we're not taking and how we need to be reaching out. And at one point, I, you know, we suggested, do we literally go door to door to door with a group of clinicians? Because that is the only way someone will have a conversation with a reliable source about the importance of vaccinations. Um, you know, it's a wide gamut of reasoning. You know, I've heard things such as, um, I don't want the government to require vaccinations. I, I understand that, but you have to also understand everyone in this room has had a polio vaccine because we've required vaccinations for quality of life and quantity of life, mortality, morbidity before. So again, a little bit concerning about that, but the vaccine is new. We've now had it to the general population for over a year. And again, the data from adverse reactions show that it is effective and that it does not cause any severe side effects. So again, it's just, I can't fully digest what is still preventing people from recognizing the fact that we are in this scenario because of unvaccination. It's, it's really hard to digest. Where was kind of the shift between, I felt like a few weeks ago, it also kind of was unvaccinated people, but I also felt like it was, you were explaining it was people not wearing masks, indoor settings again, but now I feel like it's more strictly unvaccinated people. I, I think where we saw the first shift was people coming inward, so weather changing. So around October, we started seeing a slight uptake, which we knew would happen when you started going inward. But then to kind of compound that, you had a group of individuals that were unvaccinated that chose to be in that type of larger setting or force more so, that now you saw those cases start exponentially growing. I definitely think things, there's value to Thanksgiving. People were gathering in a much more confined space. Um, because food is involved in that, people's masking is much less in compliance. Um, but yeah, I think there was levels of, uh, we saw from Thanksgiving gatherings that people, um, we saw cases grow from that as well. The last time we had a week like that was in March, and then prior to that was when we started seeing those surges in November and December of 2020. So prior to that. Yeah. Okay. And going back to what you're talking about on the Union Point and LSF saying that people are coming into the ER for reasons that are not ER related, um, can you put, I don't know if you know the answer, just put numbers on how, how many people are doing this and how, how it's affecting it? Does it have to be a I would refer to both hospital systems for the actual census, but again, I think it's just the aspect of people um, needing to recognize that our hospital systems are at a verge. They're dealing with COVID. They're also dealing with routine illnesses and routine issues that come through. And so making sure that we're appropriately using the EDs for things such as accidents and severe illness, not for getting a COVID test. So uh, regarding the Omicron um, variant, have we had a recent case? Um, we don't, we d for public health surveillance, we do not genotype all of our samples. However, we do submit samples for randomized for testing. Um, we have yet to, um, as I know right now to this point, which is exactly at 2.58, um, I'm not aware of a, a Omicron, Omicron, uh, Omicron case here locally. Having said that, I do know we are investigating ones that are tied to Omicron cases elsewhere. So again, it's a matter of when. Do you guys have any more questions about, is, are we, can you compare numbers at all of flu to COVID right now? Are we seeing more flu cases than COVID or is it COVID over flu? Right now we're seeing more COVID cases than influenza. But again, uh, flu season, we know the cadence of it and we've had flu you know, through our communities routinely. Um, but again, that's what makes this nerve-wracking in the position we are, to only have 11% uh, of our ICUs of ICU beds available. It, going into a season where we have higher respiratory illnesses, it is very concerning for uh, an individual. What was the lowest amount of ICU beds available that you've had through the whole pandemic? Um, at one point, I believe we were at 5%. 5% available. Mm -hmm. okay. 5%, a difference of 6% is only a handful of beds. Okay. And when was that? I, I, again, I believe that was in the high surge that we saw last, um, last winter. Last, last March. Yeah. 
Uh, the winter, actually, mm -hmm. last winter. So th again, our youth policy, um, you know, overall our youth population makes up a third of our cases. Um, they are kind of still mixed, that zero to uh, 19 age range with who's actually eligible. We have zero to five, under five that are not eligible for vaccines. But overall what we are seeing is that the schools, um, masking is working. We're not seeing a lot of school-based outbreaks. We're seeing that in situations where kids are not masking, such as slumber parties or pizza parties at someone's house. Yeah, no, wearing a mask on your chin is definitely not effective. Um, you know, we have seen cases um, in uh, sports teams, and so whether it's related to the actual event itself or other activities surrounding that team um, is part of that investigation work that we do. So I will just oh, go ahead, one last question. Yeah. How much do you think that, I mean, this has been 20 months now, 21 months. I mean, how much of it is just overall pandemic fatigue contributed to possibly the spike in cases with people being less adherent to the restrictions and still have not thinking about vaccines? I definitely think uh, pandemic fatigue is out there. I think more so it's not necessarily the concerns about the health and well-being, because I think at this point a lot of us know someone firsthand that's had COVID. Um, and had a varying de degree of individuals that had very mild or asymptomatic cases too. Um, many of us have um, had to you know, notify families about lost loved ones. And so, again, we've seen that entire spectrum in our community. I, I think it really relies on to the point of we want to get back to normalcy as soon as possible. I really would love to get back to normalcy as soon as possible as well. But the way to do that is to decrease cases and vaccinations are going to be the way we get to that. Um, just to end, we are tentatively have our next briefing on the 28th of December. We'll let you know if that changes um, in the meantime. Thank you all. Have a good holiday season.